Yo, yo, it's your boy Alfred Banks, man. I just jumped off the porch with Dirty Glove Bastard. You did? Getting over a heartbreak, now they call me Tom Petty. I could bad mouth her, but that's just kind of petty. And I ain't that. All right, so we got Alfred Banks jumping off the porch with us today. Indeed, indeed. And how you feeling, man? Today is a good day. Um, riding around Atlanta, it's, uh, it's good energy. Really beautiful houses out here, too. Oh, yeah. Real estate is crazy, so that's pretty cool. Nah, definitely, man. Sure. So what are you working on out here in Atlanta, man? What else you got planned? Right now, um, roaming around with uh, my publicist. We're just doing interviews and kind of reintroducing myself to Atlanta because I've done a bunch of shows here um, and, and been here a bunch, but I've never, like, really, uh, I would say, infiltrated the actual culture of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, just kind of introducing myself to folks and letting people know we, we around. And that's really the main goal this go around, for sure. Okay. I got you, man. For sure. All right. So you're from New Orleans, right? Born and raised uptown. You hear me? Uptown. There yeah. Is, man. All there. So, yeah. How would you describe your childhood coming up in uptown? What were you into as a kid, man? Um, well, you know, my brother, my, old, my oldest brother, Landis, he, uh, he rhymed. So I got introduced to hip hop, man, probably around like seven, eight. Uh, before then, I was listening to, you know, saying old school R&B, like my mom would play, you know, uh, or the 98.5 WYLD, which is like the, the like old school kind of channel, whatever the case. So um, I didn't really get introduced to rap until around eight. Um, so growing up was dope. You know what I mean? I had everything I wanted as a kid, watching my brother kind of rhyme. Um, I used to steal his raps and like rewrite the words and kind of rap it back to him. Hopefully he wouldn't catch it, uh, which was fun. And I grew up good, man. You know, I never really had any wants. Um, you know what I mean? My brother went to the Marines. My other brother went out on his own. So I was kind of low key the only child pretty much from nine years old to like 17. You know what okay. I mean? So it was pretty, it's pretty uh, interesting kind of finding my own way. Uh, you know, watching my brothers from a distance, but kind of finding my own way throughout this, this whole journey. You know what I mean? I got you. Indeed. So who were some of your favorite artists you were listening to back then when you first started rapping? Then? When I first started rhyming, um, Lupe Fiasco, uh, he changed my life. When I first heard Food and Liquor okay. was um, the moment I was like, okay, I could really take this thing for real. Because he was rhyming about things that I related to or that I could like find, I guess, some, some solace in. You know, um, Charles Hamilton is my favorite rapper pretty much of all time at this point. Um, Busta Rhymes was like the first rap I ever heard. Uh, Give Me Some More is the first music video. I guess that shows my age, but uh, <laughs> Give Me Some More is the first video I ever saw. Yeah, his videos like, were so dope. Too, so crazy. Uh, him and Missy Elliott, they just killed it. So that was really cool. Um, and kind of seeing the animation, um, let me know you could be vibrant and fun in the music and be as uh, creative as you wanted to be. So that was kind of cool. Um, Eminem coming up, always loved what Em was doing with the words and the way he would just just rhyme orange, I, you know, dude is just amazing. Um, and MF Doom, you know what okay. I'm saying? MF Doom is, is one of my favorite MCs, rest in peace. Uh, his, his just quirky way of rhyming uh, really stuck with me. So when I was coming up, those are the things I was, yeah. I was listening to for sure. No, that's dope, man, because I, I really don't hear that many, those type of influences oh, for sure. sitting on the sports, man. For sure, for sure. Yeah, not too many people listing them, man. For sure, man, so I love. Yeah, so when did you, would you say you finally started taking music serious, like figure out, all right, this is what I want to pursue, this is what I want to do? I want to say, uh, well, uh, Food and Liquor came out in 06, so that's like my sophomore year of high school. So probably around like 10th grade, 11th grade is when I was like, all right, cool, I think I'm going to do this. I started like battle rapping, like freestyle battle rapping in, in high school and stuff. And that's kind of where my base came from. So like um, rhyming the way I rhymed, everybody wasn't, you know, at that time, like Jeezy was the guy and, and, and uh, who else was like, oh, uh, around that time, that was kind of the energy. Like Wayne was like really coming of age and stuff. So if you wasn't really rhyming on no, on no street stuff, it was kind of hard to find your, your, your lane. So um, I was rhyming about, you know, not positive stuff, but just more lyrically driven stuff. But I had to do it in a more aggressive way to kind of get the point across. Yeah. So that's when I started battling. Um, so that's kind of when I figured, you know, I'm gonna really do this for real, man. I think, um, I think I could really go out here and make something of it. So around, around like sophomore year, junior year, of high school. Okay, sure. I got you. Yeah. Um, wh why do you think that is such like a dying breed these days, like real lyricists and all that? Because it seems like everything now is kind of more watered down, and just you don't hear that type of lyricism these days. I don't even know if it's a dying breed because I can name like 55 rappers who like who are on the underground who get wild money, you know what I'm saying, doing their thing. Uh, maybe in the mainstream it's, it's, a, it's a dying thing. 
Uh, but you know, I think every, what I've kind of noticed is every generation, um, there's always like maybe two to three MCs that the mainstream accept as conscious. When I was coming up, it was Lupe, uh, who else was like, like most deaf, Talib, Kanye. Those are like the, the positive guys, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And then uh, now it's like J. Cole and Kendrick. Those are the only two guys that yeah. are positive in the entire music industry, apparently. So, uh, but on the underground, there's a lot of guys doing their thing. Oh, absolutely, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And, and, and I, those are the guys I try to focus on, guys and gals that I try to focus on and support what they got going on. Um, you know what I'm saying? Um, beautiful, beautiful MCs that are, that are rocking. So, but as it pertains to the mainstream, you know, people like what they like and things kind of move in cycles and, and no matter what's hot, what type of music is hot at the moment, uh, those are the things that people kind of focus on. And, you know, there's no, no, no uh, I guess, diss to them. People like what they like, you know what I mean? And so do I, so. So what's your creative process like? Do you write all your raps or do you freestyle and punch them? As well? I, I write. Well, I, I'm really good at freestyling. So like I, uh, when I hear a beat normally, first of all, the beat just gotta kind of speak to me kind of deal. And when the beat, you know, reaches me, um, I kind of freestyle, kind of find, if I find a melody or to, to some degree, or if the hook comes to me first, or whether it's the verse that comes to me, however that works. But I do freestyle a bit to kind of fill in the blanks. And then from there, I go back and kind of write it out to kind of make it make sense kind of deal. Um, I love writing, man. I don't write as often as I should, but I do love writing and creating. Um, lately, I've been doing more writing for like things like films and commercials and stuff okay. like that. So I haven't really been um, jumping into like writing for myself and like the, the creative output. But um, in this new phase of my life of writing for things like specific things has kind of expanded my writing because um, I've been doing things outside of hip hop genre wise. I've been doing like dance music. I've been doing EDM and I've been doing uh, like rock to some degree. You know what I'm saying? Trying my best to and singing like writing songs where I don't rhyme. I'm just singing throughout the record. I'm trying to like expand. Um, and so when I, I can get in the studio with any artist, anybody, and I can literally do anything. So that's kind of the main focus right now is about, you know, uh, just to be a rapper or writer that can do anything. So. Okay. Is that much of a challenge switching over the genres nah, like that? No, it's or? not. It's not. And I, I'm blessed to kind of have that ability to where it's not really a challenge. Uh, you know, I've been, I'm in a group called Sax Kicks Ave with my man Albert uh, Allen back from Tanking the Bangers. And uh, he is one of the, I mean, man, one of the most creative producers I've ever met. Um, I actually just put out a project called The Range where every song on the project is a different genre of music. You know what I'm saying? I do my hip hop, my bravado, talking my, my shit. Um, and then I have a a song that I honestly don't even know the genre of. It's like a rock kind of EDM kind of deal. I don't really know. Then I got another record that's like R&B. You know what I'm saying? I got another record that's lo-fi kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's not really that hard. When you're really good at writing, you can kind of just do whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's really dope, man. Indeed. Um, so what's your thoughts on like the music scene in New Orleans and everything that's going on right now? I love it, man. We have, there's a collective called Global Warming, um, and man, I'm a, I'm a part of it. And just kind of seeing these young guys like coming up and I'm saying young like I'm old, but uh, just watching these guys come up doing their thing. It's amazing. Like my girl Sleazy Easy, just amazing uh, MC and singer doing her thing. Uh, my man Dominic Scott, incredible singer. My man Latranium, he's a dope singer, does like kind of pop music. My man Pell, who is, I mean, most, one of the most accomplished MCs coming out the city. Um, so the city's doing really well right now. My man K to Beast, dope up and coming MC doing his thing. So. Um, and to kind of be a part of that and to some degree maybe be one, you know, kind of climbing up that rung to be one of the guys. It's, it's an amazing thing. So kind of seeing the scene uh, expanding, growing uh, and to somewhat be a part of that is amazing. You know, what I mean, to kind of do my thing and bring back opportunities for cats to get on stage and do that thing. It, it does my heart good. You know what I'm saying? So um, I'm I'm in love with how the scene is going right now. And. I think I'm a little biased though, because I love New Orleans. You know what I mean? <laughs> no. But the city's doing well for sure. Yeah. And how much does uh, you know New Orleans that that whole culture play into your music? Then how much does that influence? You? Um, maybe not as much as you would think from an from a, a audible standpoint, but it's just like how I was saying off camera, just like the hustle and grind that you got to have coming from a city that um, you know the industry was uh, in its way for a while and kind of hasn't really. Um, I guess uh, elevated in a lot of ways. So you kind of have to think of unconventional ways to kind of get your music across. And so that's the one thing I kind of took from New Orleans was like, you know, um, maybe I shouldn't do this thing that everyone's doing. Maybe I should do this. And then 
do it this way and blah, blah, blah. So you kind of take that and put that into everything you do from the creation of the music to the, to the hustle to get the music heard, the shows you do, your stage, the whole works, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of what I took from New Orleans. That's how it inspires me, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And speaking of your performances, man, how, how'd you be able to get that opportunity to go to Germany and perform? Oh man, it was crazy. Um, so what happened was the Volkswagen commercial. Um, so we did that, we flew, flew to Spain to do it. I had never been outside the country before, so that was amazing. Um, and just, you know, being a kid from uptown, I didn't really know that you could do all that from one record, you know what I'm saying? So we, we went to Spain, filmed the commercial, and over Facebook, YouTube, and like Twitter, it got like a million views, which was crazy. Oh, wow. And so they flew me out to Hamburg, Germany, to do the Reaperbahn Festival. Hmm. Um, so that was my first time in Germany. I went out there dolo, it was crazy, I was scared because I couldn't, you know what I'm saying, speak German. But uh, <laughs> it was amazing, dog. Like, kind of just roaming around and just, just looking. And, and, you know, my safe haven is, is places where I cop sneakers. So any place I saw with shoes, I would just hang out there and ask people <laughs> questions kind of deal. But uh, it was dope, man. It was dope to know that one record could maybe not change your life, but financially it changed my life. But just, like, one song could really do something. Um, it, it changed my view of the music industry. Because up, up until that point, you know, $100 shows, $200 shows, you know, you leave with 300 bucks that night, and that's a good night. You know what I mean? I didn't know you could make five figures from one record. And it, changed, it just changed the way I viewed this music game. So I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And I got to rep New Orleans in Germany. You know what I mean? So, you know, you can't really beat that. Nah, for real. <laughs> for sure, man. for sure. So did they, like, reach out to you to use the song? Or did you have to they Okay. They did. It was dope. Um, the, the licensing company at the time I was working with, um, Volkswagen, like the song, I guess, and they hit us up. My previous uh, management, they hit him up and was like, yo, we like this song that Alfred has, and we would love for him to, you know, you, we'd love to use this song for the commercial. Excuse me, and I thought they were just gonna use the record. They wanted me to like be the face of the thing. Hmm. So I was like, oh, that's crazy. And, and they paid me quite handsomely for it, and it was, it was amazing, man. Like, shouts to them for taking a chance on me. Cause when I dropped that song, that song only had like maybe a thousand streams on Spotify or SoundCloud or something. Like, oh, wow. you know what I'm saying? Maybe 900 views on YouTube. It wasn't like, it wasn't doing really anything. And, and they just heard it. And I think that's a great example of music, uh, good music finding its place and, and being discovered. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to have a million views to get a bag. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that's dope. really dope. That's really inspiring for other artists. Yeah, for sure, too, man. man. It was amazing, dog. Trust me, if I could do it, you know, you can do it. Cause I never, I didn't come from money. I didn't come from, you know what I'm saying, no cosigns. I, you know, um, I had to kind of get it off the muscle. And I, I was blessed to walk a rap really well, you know? So like people just was like, man, I don't know nobody that know him, but that boy could rap. I'm gonna put him on stage and see what he do. And I, you know, the, I guess the, the, the given talent that I have, I, I just blow people away and, and it's amazing, you know? And I don't say that in a cocky way. I just say that from a, I just bust my behind to really just, well, I bust my ass to, to really uh, be one of the best performers, the best, you know, live performers, best MCs in every room I step in. Yeah. And then just to have that confidence. Um, and that confidence was given to me just by, you know, I guess all the MCs I destroyed over the years. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's no doubt. How was the energy at that performance in Germany? And how does, how would you say those crowds overseas compared to here in the States? Then? It was the first time I did a show where they didn't get any of my American references. So that was, that was, uh, I'm talking about, uh, you know, first of all, like if I go across the you know, United States, I could reference something in New Orleans. Everybody know Bourbon Street, everybody know Mardi Gras. So I could throw something like that in there. People that would at least get an idea of it. But when you over there, they don't know nothing about that. So like, you know, you saying you're Mardi Gras, what was that? And it's like, oh snap, okay. Now I gotta think of something else to get you guys or whatever. So. It was a challenge, uh, but they loved it. Um, I saw a lot of merch. It was, it was a great time. I performed actually for, uh, it was like a Volkswagen stage. Uh, so it was like a, uh, the company that licensed my record teamed with Volkswagen to put on a stage and they were like, yo, this commercial we did, this guy is the guy who the song was with. And so here's an hour rap and that's what we did. So it was a great time, man. Um, I made a lot of you know, dope supporters that I still have to this day and I can't wait to go back out there. Oh, that's dope right there, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, Got to go back to, you know, being a sneakerhead, man. For so sure. How far back does your love for sneakers go, man? Um, eight or nine. You know what I'm saying? I was, uh, 
I remember my, my pops bought me a pair, uh, and to this, I can't remember if it was Jordan 13s, but I know it was a white and light blue colorway, late 90s, so it had to be like a 13, okay. 98, something like that. And I remember, 99 maybe, but I remember they were white and light blue, and I remember they were a girl colorway. And this is the 90s, so you can't wear like a girl shoe or whatever. So my mom was like, nah, we gotta take them back. And I was like, nah, man, I really like this shoe. And she was like, nah, and that feeling that I got of her taking that shoe away from me like really hurt, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, you know what? Um, when I get older, I'm gonna get money and I ain't gonna never have this feeling again. I'm gonna buy every shoe I want and no one's gonna ever take them away from me. So that's kind of where it started. Uh, but man, over the years, man, it just, I don't even know. It was shoes I wanted in high school I couldn't get and then shoes in high school I, I had in retrospect wish I kept, you know what I'm saying? I, I remember having the De La Soul Highs Oh, wow. Bought those for 30 bucks, you know what I'm saying? Sold them for like 90, you know what I'm saying? I had the Melvin's SBs. Like I was rocking SBs in 05, 06, you know what I'm saying? Back, you know, whatever. So having all these SBs and people ribbing me for wearing skateboard shoes, you know what I'm saying? And now it's the popular thing. Now if you don't have a pair of SBs, you ain't lit, you know what I'm saying? So, or, you know, wearing a Ville Vibrams or wearing a Greedy Genius and all these different like brands of sneakers. Um, you know, and throughout the years, man, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pairs uh, that I've had and kind of got rid of throughout the years. And when COVID hit, man, I had to actually start selling sneakers to keep things going, you know oh, what I'm saying? Because wow. COVID shut all my shows down. So I lost like 60 shows uh, due to COVID. So, um, you know, I had to sell a lot of shoes from my collection to, you know what I'm saying, make things happen. And I'm just so grateful for them, you know what I'm saying? But shoes are just dope. It's my way of expressing myself. Some days I'm feeling real muted, so I'll rock a pair of black shoes, black with the white bottoms, or some days I'm feeling loud, like, you know, reverse Papa Bears today or whatever the case. So I love them, man. Shoes are dope. It's yeah. a dope way to express yourself. What are some of your favorite pairs that you own right now? Uh, favorite pair, my favorite pair of Jordans is the Peapie 8. Uh, it's that blue with the orange guts. Them joints is crazy. Um, I got a pair of uh, Nike Terminators, a Swagger collab. One shoe is like chocolate brown, the other is like mint. Um, first person I ever saw those was Lupe, and then my man Mickey Fax, uh, he had them when I met him, and uh, I was like, I'm gonna get them shoes, and then when I did the commercial, that was the first pair I bought, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, I copped the hell out of those. Um, I got the uh, Red Octobers, uh, the Yeezy Joints, uh, obviously that's my most expensive sneaker. Um, uh, another pair I like, I like Terminators, Nike Terminators. So there's a picture of Jay Dilla uh, right before he passed away. He's doing a show in, in France and he's in a wheelchair and he's got these red, yellow and white Nikes on. And I always was like, yo, I need them joints. I need them joints. And there was a uh, Supreme Court, the Nike Terminator Supreme Court that came out in 04. And I was like, he died in 06, but he had those on. I was like, I need them. And I bought those. So those like, I don't even wear them. I just bought them because those like the Dilla shoes for me. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and every pair I buy has a story behind them or, you know, I just get them for free or something like that. So. <laughs> Can't complain with that. Can't complain at all. Yeah, man, so. yeah. Uh, I understand you're a big advocate for mental health, man. Indeed, man, indeed. My oldest brother, um, he uh, died by suicide, man. He uh, suffered from schizophrenia. And so before his death, I had no previous knowledge of what mental health was. You know, coming from a family like mine, we just prayed things away. You know what I'm saying? It was never really a situation where you went to go get therapy or nothing like that. Uh, so when he passed, I did a lot of research on what he was going through because I was, you know, writing an album about what he was going through and through that research, I just was like, wow, man, I found that there's millions of people across the world that are dealing with some form of mental health issue, whether it's PTSD, anxiety, schizophrenia, just the whole works. Uh, and you know, me, I suffer from depression um, and I'm bipolar, you know what I'm saying? So these, these things that I never could put words to. Uh, I felt and I felt and I always dealt with and had to, you know, whatever, but I, I didn't know the term, I didn't know. And so doing that research really, uh, it taught me what was going on. And so when I found out so many people were going through it, I just was like, well, look, I got a little bit of a platform, you know, um, maybe I could talk about it a little bit and, and help just bring awareness in whatever way I can. And uh, in a way, keeping my brother like alive and kind of getting his name out because he was Alandis Banks was such an amazing person, a dope MC, um, you know, great brother, even better, uh, you know, husband and things like that. Um, so I just kind of want people in a selfish way. I want everybody to know his name. Um, but in, in, in that same, I guess, path, just spreading the word about mental health is something I'm very passionate about because uh, we all go through it to some degree, you know, like in New Orleans, 
we got like Katrina and mm -hmm. Hurricane Ida and Andrew and all these different hurricanes, that PTSD, that stress, you know, anxiety and all these things. Um, and also being from a city where we were the murder capital for so many years, um, you know, uh, I think Soldier Simpson said it best, if you made it out the 90s, you were a real one. Um, so these are the type of things we have in our DNA. Uh, so, you know, we, we're, we're forced to kind of work through that throughout the years and go to work with that on our hearts and in our blood. And, and you know, I think it's time that we, you know, as, as a people, you know, black people, just everyone uh, across the board, go get some therapy, man. Do some things to help. It's okay to not be okay, but once you understand that, what are you going to do to get okay? You know what yeah. I'm saying? And that's, that's just where I'm at with it at this point. No, that's dope. Why do you think there is such a stigma on, you know, people going to see a therapist? I think there's a stigma um, because you're supposed to be self-sufficient. We're taught, I think, just as a human race, if, you know, you need help, then you're weak. Um, you know, and I, there's, no, there's no truth in that. You know, I don't know a, a single successful anything that did it by themselves. You know what I mean? So you need help. Uh, but I think, you know, you're supposed to be self-sufficient. You're supposed to be doing it on your own. You're supposed to grind it out from the mud. It's like, man, I need help sometimes. And mental health is something that can truly derail you. Any success you may have, it can take you off that track. It can, it can ruin relationships. Trust me, I know that. But, um, you know, go get some help, man. Therapy is, is amazing. And, you know, during COVID, losing all the shows I lost and all the other things that, that went on in my life, uh, you know, long-term relationship ending as well, uh, therapy really helped me get through it. Therapy really showed me that this, you know, people can, you know, hear your problems, help you out with, you know, some suggestions on solutions and things like that. And just honestly, for me, it was talking to someone that was non-biased, you know what I'm saying? Really getting down to the nitty gritty of my issues and figuring out ways to, to kind of move forward and be better from those things. And I think a lot of people could benefit from that. So, you know, therapy is a, it's a okay by me. <laughs> no doubt. No, definitely, man. All right, so you just dropped a new song today, man. Kaleidoscope. What can you yeah, tell us man. About this? Um, the video, actually. The video, oh, the video dropped okay. today. And man, uh, I'm so proud of it. Shouts to my man Pell, shouts to Latranium uh, for being a part of that. Um, so I'm in this group, Sass Kicks Ave. Um, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm in that mode, I don't really do hip hop. It's more like, you know, I rhyme, but we do like, you know what I'm saying, R&B, soul, dance music, like some real alternative stuff. And Kaleidoscope is one of those records, again, kind of showing my range as an MC, just showing that if you put the beat on, I could, I could write to anything. And it's a real fun record. Shouts to my man Pell, that's my bro. Um, he's a well-accomplished uh, artist doing his thing all over the world. Um, so to have him on the record is an honor. And having my man, you know, Grammy-nominated Albert Allen back producing is oh, just dope. dope. And that video was amazing, man. Like, uh, nice quality. It's fun. We had a lot of fun shooting on that joint. We, I do the Harlem Shake in the video, so that just kind of shows <laughs> how fun it is. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. It's dope. I know you just dropped the range, but are you working on a, your next project yet? Actually, uh, I've had an album kind of been like sitting in the can since like beginning of COVID. Oh, really? Um, this project I just put out called uh, One Guy Standing By Himself, mm -hmm. uh, that was just like a spur of the moment kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, it came out and it debuted at number three on iTunes, which was really cool. And, um, you know, lots of people were checking, just sharing it and showing love. And I was on the cover of some local magazines back at the crib. It was dope, man. It was a blessing. Um, so, and the range is so cool too, again, showing where I'm at and, but I think my new project is more, uh, I guess I'll say it's called Yester Month. Okay. Um, it's more of a project where, you know, I'm just kind of talking about COVID, talking about my actual experience during COVID. Cause it's something that I haven't, I've kind of hinted at, but I haven't really gone into deep. Um, and we're still in COVID, but you know, just when it was at its peak kind of deal. So, uh, Yester Month, I don't know when it's going to come out, probably maybe December, January, I'm not sure, but. Um, I'm very excited about that. But all this music we've been putting out is people have been really gravitating to it. It's really dope, man. I, I can't complain at all. People, people like when I rap and stuff. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Would you ever expected that when you first started? Uh, what do you mean? People liking my music? Like not on the rap side, you know, kind of just being there. It's dope. Switch. For me, the coolest part is are people that are enjoying my music when I'm not rhyming. That's the cool part because it lets me know that the things that I'm, it lets me know I'm not crazy. Because when I'm, I'm hearing stuff in my head, and I'm like, yo, I know this is hot. I know this is dope. They're going to love it. And then I put it out, and people are like, yo, this is hot. I'm like, yes, I wasn't crazy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, people love it, man. And I love doing fun stuff. You know, rap for me is pretty easy. So I love doing things that kind of challenge me and just, you know, um, shows my, my abilities. And that's the stuff that I really get the gratification for 
Um, it's just that feeling when I was in high school jumping in the cypher. You know what I'm saying? You know, people never heard of you and it's like you rhyme and they go, oh, you super dope, I want to So I get that same feeling when I put out a record, something people didn't expect me to do and then I do it and they're like, oh, this is dope, I thought you just rapped. And it's like, all right, cool. So, yeah. No, that's dope, man. No doubt. What's some of your plans or some of your goals for 2022 as the new year? Oh, man, getting back on the road um, because pre-COVID, man, it was like 100 shows a year. Um, so now it's getting back on the road. Uh, I got some, some things in the can with some really dope people. Um, more music, uh, this little range situation. I put out a song every Sunday in the month of October. So it showed that if, you know, doing that more frequently, people gravitate to music coming out more frequently. So we're going to be putting out more music in 2022, uh, more shows, uh, more appearances, and, and doing more in the mental health space as well, uh, speaking at different places and stuff like that. So that's what we got on the horizon, man. And I'm just, I'm just excited. I think 2022 is going to be amazing. Um, you know, it's going to be good for me financially as well as uh, just from an energy standpoint, doing things I've never done before. I want to do venues I've never done before. I want to rock in front of, you know, five figure crowds, you know what I'm saying? That's that's the that's the goal. So bigger festivals, I want, you know what I'm saying, do all those things. So that's all I got. I got a lot of plan for 2022 for sure. No, it sounds like you got a lot of Yeah, plate, man. man. <laughs> Trying to knock it down one brick at a time, I guess. For so. sure, man. All right, you got any last words for your fans? Any shout outs you like to give before we wrap it up here? Um shouts to my my brother Marcel P. Black Aaron just all dump. That's my man's in them. Um shouts to uh, my man Kater Beast, my man Mickey Fax, I was just stayed at his spot a couple of days ago, shouts to him. Um, shoot, I don't know, just everybody that just shows love, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I'm just so happy to just be where I'm at, so everybody that, that believes in me, shouts to them. Um, and I'll do my due diligence to be a guy you can represent proudly, you know what I mean? <laughs> no doubt. Getting over heartbreak, now they call me Tom Petty I could badmouth her, but that's just kind of petty And I ain't that guy, I would rather spend